Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 50th episode of Retuning Your Firm. Um, really excited to be with you today, and I hope that uh, we're going to have a really interesting and fascinating show. Um, got three guests. Firstly, um, and I think I've got this book right, Alderman and Sheriff Professor Michael Manley <clears throat> of ZDN Group, otherwise better known as Michael, and he's talking a bit about the future of work and of professional services, which is a, a pretty big topic to squeeze into five minutes. So we're going to hear, I think, two or three really interesting themes there. Our second guest is Helen Brand, OBE, who is the Chief Executive of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. I think I've got that bit right, better known as the ACCA. And she's talking about some research that was conducted by the ACCA into particularly the views of Generation Z and what that means for the future of the accountancy profession. Now, some of you may recall a few months ago, we um, saw a government white paper which emerged looking at corporate governance and the role of auditors. And uh, I suspect that this is beginning to percolate into the body, into the thinking of Generation Z as well as to what sort of career does that mean? So it'd be really interesting to hear what, what her research has to say. Our third guest is uh, Oliver Dudok Van Heel. And Oliver is the head of client sustainability and environment. Now, what's interesting to me about that job title is the word client. I know quite a lot of head of sustainabilities. I don't know very many who have the word client because what you're actually beginning to see, and Oliver will expand on this, is that professional firms may not themselves have a massive carbon footprint and things that go with it, but actually their clients do. And it's very important for professional firms to help your clients, particularly with COP26 coming up later in the year. And he works, as I mentioned before, on uh, uh, Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer. He's also a, um, a lecturer <clears throat> on, a head of, on a sustainability master's at Cambridge. So keeps that kind of nice balance between what's going on the, the practical world and the academic world. Fascinating project in New York he's going to mention about shortly. And his theme today is best practice in sustainability. Um, I really won't say my guest because after 48 appearances, Francesca is not my guest. Francesca is my... My companion, I think, is probably the best word. Um, but Francesca, welcome today. Um, she's the global leader of network capabilities at Grant Thornton. And she mentioned the other day she also trained as a barrister. So um, has that ability to switch very quickly between the legal world and the accountancy world, which sometimes can be a bit of a barrier. So welcome, Francesca, and lovely to have you on the show. And of course, yours truly, um, Richard Chaplin founder and chief exec of the Managing Partners Forum. And um, I don't think when I started this show, just before the first lockdown, can you believe that? Uh, 18th, 20th of March, something like that of last year, that I honestly, I don't think anybody uh, expected this to get to uh, <clears throat> a grand total of 50 episodes and all of the next month all in ready in place with great guests and everything. So uh, all I can say is thank you for being a great audience. Uh, really appreciate your input on the polls. We'll come to one of those in a minute. And um, let's keep looking at ways we can help our sector through what remains a period of great uncertainty. Um, we're now running, as you probably gathered in the forum, we're running a series of shows. But before we do that, I just really wanted to um, kind of <clears throat> have a little image just to kind of give us a little bit of a, a feel good Zen moment while we can watch those candles burn. But um, I know it's not that simple, is it? But anyway, onwards and upwards. So really, what are we doing in the forum at the moment? Well, we've got a um, fairly active um, event coming up on the 22nd of June. It's about a month's time. And what I've done there, if you recall, it's called Retuning Your Firm Summit. So um, Manfresco and others will be moderators, but we've brought back 25 of the people whose videos, and you'll be seeing today's as well in your course, uh, were, were scored highest on YouTube. So you, you the audience, chose the, chose the people you wanted to hear from. So that's great. Like one of these um, music shows, I guess. Um, hundreds of people watching those videos. Don't miss out. You'll get three more edited today, and they're going to be great, I'm sure. Uh, a little bit about our peer groups, again, going from strength to strength, very much key part of what we do. We're looking at something like 100% renewal on our peer groups at the moment, which is completely amazing. So we're really happy about that. And it's not just for the firm-wide leaders. We've also got them for the CEOs and for the HR directors. Um, may have picked up a note from me about 24-7 networking clubs. Uh, it's all very well sitting in an audience and uh, being a webinar. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's a bit like a TV show. This is, this is slightly different. You can actually join the club. Um, choose whether you want to be anonymous or choose whether you want to show your any of your personal you know, job title or anything like email or anything like that. Um, but then more important discussion forum. And then once a month, monthly social, where we all get together in Remo and we'll actually have a chance to sit down, do a little bit of speed networking. It was really interesting. We did one a couple of weeks ago and two of the uh, people found that they had a common interest in 
water painting, watercolour painting. And they spent very happy 15 happy minutes talking about, mm, do you start with the drawing or do you start with the paint and different techniques about watercolour painting? And I never would have known it. And, and the, you know, very senior people, but hey, we all go at night, home at night in the lift. That's my view. And lastly, um, and I'm going to give you a sneak preview here. Very exciting. Um, we have the awards coming up on the 22nd of June, and we're going to be having them in our beautiful Italian garden um, with sounds of birds in the background and people will be able to hang out. So I thought, well, if you're going to have awards, you always have to have them in some sort of hall. Why not have them now that we're in virtual in the garden? Why not? Much more fun, particularly if it's the, after all the 10th of June, so which is um, hopefully going to be better weather than we've been having for the past week or two, that's for sure. So <clears throat> moving on to where we're at, as you probably know, um, we have feedback uh, from our polls from UK government. And I always love this quote, which is why I kind of repeat it every time, I'm probably bored of seeing it if you're a regular, but uh, I couldn't buy it if I tried. And it came to me completely unre unrequested. Your poll results are incredibly valuable and analysis during these dynamic times. Well, um, guess what? The times are still dynamic. So guess what? Your poll uh, and contribution is still hugely welcomed by government as well as obviously by yourselves. So, so what happened at the last... Um, Let's just run through what happened two weeks ago. Seems like ages, doesn't it? What happened on the, and I'm just going to, I'm not going to give you some charts. I'll just pick up some of the key themes so that you can actually kind of reflect on them. Um, we were talking here about development pathways, and this was some research that um, Julian Birkinshaw of London Business School, who was also on the show, um, shared with me. And he, we were looking at what are the things that really matter in personal development during lockdown? And there were three. And what we did was we asked, uh, people, uh, what did you think were the important things before lockdown and which were the ones important during lockdown? And the three that came through were being exposed to a variety of experiences, taking on challenging assignments and working collaboratively with others. And what was quite interesting was that those three elements remained in the same order, both before and after lockdown, but there was less, uh, the scores were lower consistently during lockdown for those three elements. So where was it being made up? Well, basically, possibly as you'd expect, social digital, we're on virtual at the moment, to stay informed was the biggest gainer. And that actually grew from 6% pre-lockdown to 24%. And remember, this is the, the three most effective. So it's not a ranking in that sense, but these are the three things that people include in their top three. So, so that was quite interesting. Um, now turning to what didn't work, what were the least effective elements in personal development? And again, this was the order. The first, the most, the one that came at the top in terms of least effective was taking part in training programs. 73% of them, people included that in their top three. Next was getting support from a coach or mentor. Maybe that's easier face-to-face -face than on a screen. Actually, our coaching program hasn't proved that to be the case, which is interesting. Uh, that's 53%. And um, observing how your boss and others operate. Well, again, that's probably a bit hard when you're actually all sitting watching the screen because you don't get the same ability to observe things. So, so those were the least effective elements. Now, were the order the same? Well, they weren't quite because actually training was only included by a third of people pre-lockdown. So pretty massive shift from 33% all the way up to 73% in terms of people including it in their top three. So clearly training programs were not seen as having cut the mustard and we'll be talking to our HR group about that next week and try and work out how they can maybe look at ways to enhance that. The other one that, again, it wasn't in the top three, but it was there, was the fifth, I think it was, receiving challenging feedback from our boss. And that increased from 20% of people to 40% of people. And the way that kind of makes sense, because um, actually having a really difficult, challenging appraisal conversation with your boss on Zoom isn't something that's very easy. Um, so we kind of said, well, you know, what are people doing about it? What are some of the remedies? Um, well, 88% 88, 88 of firms are absolutely continuing with their career management. Yeah, that's absolutely essential. We're not going to let lockdown get in the way of that. Uh, 10 to 12% are. But no, almost everyone's in their career management. We're going to keep that uh, rolling. Around half said we're going to make sure it's not always the A team that allocated to new important projects because clearly learning is really experiential and going on an important project with a big with a top team is really, really great way for people to learn. Um, about 40 percent, a bit over, were looking out for interesting projects, either for themselves or their teams. In other words, to make sure that people were being kept challenged rather than just going through the same old, same old. Um, around a third thought that they've actually focused on enhanced mentorship for some of their new hires and some of their sort of uh, high flyers. So again, that was an important area. And, uh, and then lastly, picking up the point about uh, interviews with the boss, 
sometimes that's easier if there's somebody else in the space as some sort of moderator. I mean, it's quite common at uh, international conferences dealing with disputes, maybe, but not apparently in terms of appraisal discussions. And I remember we had, I think it was last week, uh, you remember this, Francesca, where um, uh, we had um, Steve who runs uh, Michael Page and he was saying, yeah, we got 7,000 people. The idea of having 7,000 moderators fills me with horror. But yes, there could be a situation where that might be useful. Um, but uh, moving on from there. So those were, the, those were the sort of feedback that we had from the last poll. So thank you all for those who completed it. And I, I think it was a really interesting poll. And I, I think as we move into a hybrid world, some of those elements will continue. And a lot of people are now saying, well, actually, training courses are seem to work online, but maybe that's not what our feedback is telling them. So we're going to encourage the training people to rethink some of those points, I think. So let's think about today. What are we going to do today? Well, it's the monthly sector. I know you'll say it's the 7th of May, but I, didn't, I, I wasn't on last week. And there were two reasons. One, because I had my second vaccine uh, on the Wednesday before the Friday. And I thought might not be a good idea to be. I, I was fine, by the way, but I thought might not be a good idea to that. And secondly, it was a long weekend. So lots of people said, oh, I'm, off, I'm off on Friday. So I thought, well, I do want an audience. So uh, I think I'll jump that one. So and we're now running the 7th of um, which is today. Obviously, we're going to run the poll today. Um, what are we looking at? And if you've done this tracker before, then you'll be familiar with this. But, but broadly, what, are the, what the tracker covers is business priorities and various to optimal performance, issues being discussed at management meetings, projected dip in your firm's income, activity levels, headcount and new workflow over the next year, extent of home working and office space requirements post the pandemic. And I think when we look at some of the results, and you may have seen them on some of the infographics we do, um, to say that the lines kind of zigzag all over the place is an understatement. Uh, it has been the most fascinating year in which to be taking a barometer every month as to what people's views are. So what are the polls telling us today? Um, the ones that typically come through very strongly in terms of priority are uh, developing a clear purpose and strategy, which absolutely remains the case. Uh, increasing operational efficiency and developing people's skills and capabilities. So uh, uh, there's no great surprises there. In terms of the dip in income, uh, trivially small people, most, most people, 75% none at all, a small amount, 10 and then really nothing above. In terms, do you expect to expand or contract the level of activity at your firm over the next year? Uh, modest expansion, um, a little bit more exp a contraction, about 12%. That's about the same as in previous months, so no, no real changes there. In terms of new work, 88%. Uh, expecting modest, 6% is significant, with nobody expecting contraction. So very bullish picture coming through on new work. And in terms of headcount, again, interesting there, 81% uh, expansion and... 6% contraction. So very much across the level of whether level activity, headcount, or um, the whole area of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, new work, pretty very, very buoyant. Um, what about working from home? Um, on this occasion, we haven't really got anybody who is all at home or all at work. It's kind of everybody's kind of thinking of being working at home for some of the period and around half, 50%. So that's... Um, Kind of nice round number. Um, office space requirements, mostly about the same. And I suppose if you're looking at expansion, then it may be that you're going to stay with the same office and reuse it in different ways and allow for, for more people. But uh, nobody's looking for more space. That won't surprise, I think. Uh, and still 20% are looking for 30% less. Or So there's a big chunk of people who are definitely going to be vacating some of their offices. And we've got um, yeah, Catherine McKinley. Um, McGuinness of the City of London coming on in a couple of weeks' time. So it'll be interesting to hear what she's doing. And obviously, Michael, as the sheriff of the City of London, will be very much involved in those conversations as well, I suspect. Uh, moving on to what are the constraints, what's getting in the way. Uh, as, as before, the biggest item remains the financial health of the client base. Um, and uh, the poor economic outlook actually is falling away a bit. Uh, that was very much up there with the client health, but it isn't at the moment anymore. And I guess um, after Hartlepool, maybe there's less political uncertainty. So um, let's just see what emerges from that one. Um, in terms of what's carrying the most weight, what are people actually talking about? Again, we have the two sort of core areas, finance and cash flow, which won't surprise you. Marketing and new business ge generation is actually up there with um, uh, towards the top. That wasn't the case six, nine months ago. Uh, there's definitely been a focus on new clients. But as we saw a minute ago, uh, we know people are very bullish, bullish about new work. 
And then the final one, which is, you know, um, what have, how have we done? How have we done as leaders? How have we seen to have done during the past year? And these, uh, we're told by Andrew Kakabadzu, who's one of our advisable members, professor of governance at Henley, these are amazingly high numbers for any sector. 94% saying that leaders are accessible, 75% saying that people share their options, sharing their options, 65, 63% employees are valued as highly as stakeholders, 56% sharing the pain. Um, perhaps a little bit low on transparency, but 44, I think, for most other sectors would be pretty amazing. And none of the, for none of the firms are none of those statements true. In other words, all firms seem to be doing something with their leadership team. So, so it's, it's not pat on the back, but I do think that one of the reasons why we as a sector have been seen to do quite well is precisely because leadership has seen to have absolutely engaged with this new agenda and uh, to have uh, done the right thing. So on which happy note, I will now um, pass on to Michael, Michael Manelli, um, who is going to talk a little bit about the future of work. Well, thank you, Richard. Uh, a real delight to be here. Uh, many congratulations on your 50th anniversary. I think it's been quite prescient of you to use retuning or fine tuning uh, during this uh, period of pandemic and lockdown. And for those of you in the audience, I happen to serve on the Professional and Business Services Council with Richard, and I can vouch that uh, Bayes uh, in government, Quasi Quartang's uh, department, uh, really does look quite seriously at the MPF results and takes them, that as a key form of insight. Anyway, I've been asked to make some remarks uh, for four or five minutes on the future of work and professional services. Um, like all of us, I come from a kind of a background where I think I know everything because uh, I'm experiencing it. Uh, but I hope to base most of my uh, insights here on the work that my firm does on the Global Financial Centers Index, the Global Green Finance Index, and the Smart Centers Index. And these three large indices are used to uh, rate about 115 firm, oh, sorry, 15 financial centers and commercial centers around the world every six months. So I'm drawing really upon that. Uh, as we've seen uh, over the years, one of the things that's intriguing has been the compression in competition among centers. Uh, many years ago, the City of London Corporation conducted a survey of its main competitors uh, back in 2002, and it looked at every single one of them, New York, Frankfurt, Paris. Oh, sorry, that was it. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, and these days we, we see ourselves up against easily 100 uh, financial centers and commercial centers around the world. Uh, all of these centers are focused on the basics, uh, knowledge and skills, uh, connectivity, making sure their infrastructure is okay, uh, in integrating technology into everything, whether it's fintech, regtech, agtech, medtech, uh, being green, uh, getting a regulatory balance right. And when they, all that's kind of done, uh, trying to develop themselves uh, to be a bit more cosmopolitan and cultural. So the strategies have, have really come down. And with the exception of a very few unique geographical locations, such as port cities, cities are oddly uh, starting to resemble each other more and more. Um, so I'd like to point out five trends that we have seen. Uh, the first one is that the intensity and density power laws of cities have been weakening. Uh, and in fact, to some degree, the pandemic has pointed out the weakness of single points of failure in cities with very, very high uh, reliance upon commuting, uh, of which the city of London is one. Uh, but this also applies to other cities with intense commuter activity. The mid-range cities have actually not experienced that. Uh, but these intensity and density power laws were already weakening before the pandemic. Uh, the second thing I'd like to point to is uh, the decline in business travel, an often unremarked statistic, which would have been probably the talking point of 2020 had it not been overcome by the complete collapse of air travel, was, believe it or not, that business travel in Scandinavia had declined in 2019, a boom year, by 8%, really due to fleets come flight shaming, so people not wanting to travel because of their carbon footprint. The other thing that we've seen uh, has been a huge boom in professional services exports. Uh, we're able to sell abroad uh, internationally because the barriers have been lowered uh, via technology such as video conferencing. And I think that turns up in Richard's poll just now. The third item I'd say is it's becoming a little bit harder to determine what is a financial center. Uh, it's blending into some type of perhaps a knowledge cluster and it's not even necessarily uh, based geographically. We're seeing firms in uh, France, Italy, and Spain uh, getting knocks on the door saying you've got 75 people in chalets or something, and therefore you have an establishment in our country, uh, even though they're not incorporated there. And likewise, we've seen people uh, being uh, pursued for individual and personal tax 
in similar jurisdictions because they, they've been there for longer than three months. Um, as I've often remarked, the city of London has had a torrid COVID-19, uh, the complete collapse down to approximately 5% of normal traffic. But the southeast of England, of uh, tech and uh, financial services cluster, has had a boom here. We're also moving towards 15-minute cities. This was a, uh, an idea promulgated by Carlos uh, Romano, a, a, a Colombian uh, French economist, and picked up by Anne Hidalgo, uh, the mayor of Paris. But there are genuine correlations that cities where uh, seven basic things, such as a uh, cafe, sports facility, uh, medical facility, et cetera, are within 15 minutes walk of you, have performed better in terms of morale. And finally, we're seeing a move, I think, uh, to rethinking our, our physical infrastructure uh, to be more coffee house or campus type. And certainly that's what I'm hearing from developers. So what three trends would I point you to? Well, the first is when work becomes home and home becomes work. Um, and I think not a lot has been, uh, not a lot has really looked at the point that home, uh, when it is work, you need to know your staff much better. You need to understand their home place design. We talk about workplace design, but we don't talk about home place design. Uh, doing some work at the moment, believe it or not, with the furniture makers, looking at uh, why is it that people are taking things from offices and bringing them home to their workspace. These weren't designed. Uh, desks at the office were not designed to be desks at home. Um, I think that we're going to be seeing a lot more experimental technology and arch architectural design techniques. Uh, and obviously, people are talking about providing better mental, uh, social, and financial support. Uh, a woman I, I like a lot is Melissa Fisher. She's a cultural anthropologist at NYU. And she is talking about things like mobility ambassadors who go out and actually help make that work becomes home and home becomes work, work itself. Uh, the second thing I'd point to is we're going to be moving from management by attendance to management by achievement. Uh, frankly, this is about growing up as firms. We, we rely far too much on people coming to the office uh, as a substitute uh, for performance. And I think in many ways, uh, amongst the managing partner forum, it's going to be a bit easier here. You know, for fearners, have always had a little bit more uh, ability to be measured, um, but it's an opportunity as well to help clients. I'm expecting things like more gamification, new forms of appraisals uh, in our firm, uh, we, in fact, uh, don't do any training. We use MOOCs for that. Uh, and we've, I think, also seen a, a huge change in culture already. Things are more egalitarian. Things are more punctual. And things are slightly more informal. Uh, I noticed in this poll, our leaders are accessible. Well, I certainly have been more accessible to my team because I can dive in and have a, a pretty good sort of 80% meeting with them via video conferencing. So uh, many years ago, we were all told to get out there and walk the floor. Well, I think now it's about going and Zooming the team. And the third bit I'd like to point to is morale. Morale is actually more measurable and manageable than ever. It's actually really tough to figure out what the morale is at the office. Everybody's in sort of an interesting mood, often under stress, often trying to concentrate on something. I think we could be much more creative about ways of meeting and getting the morale out there, but also surveying it. Uh, in our firm, we have virtual coffees and teas where you're not allowed to talk work and people don't have to attend them, but they do. They, they come more, more often than not. We can also host more frequent big meetings where we, we minimize the distance between the leadership and the team. We are spending, I think, more time with the staff. And I'm expecting to see much more uh, analysis where we're looking really at the deep networks in our firms and trying to work out the weak links and strengthen them and figure out why the strong links are working. And finally, I'm, I'm expecting us to develop a whole set of new symbols and rituals to encourage online morale. So those would be the three points I'd raise. Work becomes home, home becomes work. Moving from management by attendance to management by achievement and working hard on the fact that morale is more measurable and manageable and doing something about that. So thank you, Richard. Oh, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, I think with a really interesting session we had recently on informal networks and how important they are. And I think that's something, again, I've seen really rise very much up the agenda. Helen, come and tell us um, some thoughts about the ACCA and also obviously your excellent research you've done and what's Generation Z looking at this sector and thinking? Over to you. Well, thank you, Richard. And um, thank you for inviting me, particularly to your 50th birthday. Uh, I feel very privileged. Um, one, one of the valuable things about being um, 
uh, a global professional accountancy body is, is, of course, the range of international insight that we tap into across the markets we serve. And you may be aware that ACCA, together with the IMA, which is the Institute of Management Accountants based in the USA, we also operate um, the largest quarterly economic survey of professional accountants in the world. And we've been tracking that since 2008, uh, which is extremely helpful, uh, I think, to government, as you said, and, and to others. And it's this kind of harvesting and analysis of global insight that forms the backbone of our profession, what we call professional insights output. Um, and the report I want to talk about today, Groundbreakers, Gen Z and the Future of Accountancy, looks at the aspirations and ambitions of Gen Z, drawing on a global survey of 9,000 18 to 25 year olds. And that was conducted in November and December 2020 and combined with insight from employer roundtables around the world and third party research. And it's a joint report with IFAC, the International Federation of Accountants, which, you know, reflecting the global nature again of the research that we've done. And it's very much hot off the prof uh, press insight for, for this forum. We released it earlier this week. You might, some of you might have seen it covered in Wednesday's edition of the FT. So the report examines how the ambitions of younger people will help shape the next generation of work and discusses the strategies organisations should be adopting to help this generation to thrive and therefore their own businesses. Um, I know your firms conduct your own research into this, these issues and it'd be very interesting to know what resonates with you uh, in this forum and what might, might be new and different uh, in terms of the feedback that we've gathered from Gen Z. Uh, because the fieldwork took place in the midst of the pandemic in particular countries, um, it also reflects how Gen Z were feeling about prospects and recovery in the light of COVID uh, and the fact the road to recovery um, is very different in different places. So we, we are at a different place in time and attitudes are quite different. But Looking globally at the heart of Gen Z's career aspirations is the economic and social context they've been witness to coupled with the past 12 months, fueling concerns about job opportunities and security, well-being and mental health. Our data shows that personal concerns as these rank significantly higher for our survey respondents than issues impacting what wider society, so broader issues such as climate change, diversity and inclusion and equality. Now, it's, it's of course possible these issues have temporarily moved down the priority list given the personal challenges presented by the pan pandemic. Job insecurity may that be their biggest concern, but it doesn't mean that Generation Z is intent on accepting just any job to play safe. Our data suggests they attack these insecurities with quite different strategy, seeking organisations that can provide them with continuous skills acquisition and a good work-life balance. And these factors score highly when it comes to satisfaction with employers for those Gen Z um, already in the workplace. But see, other key attraction factors such as high compensation, opportunities to work internationally and rapid advancement are less well matched, possibly suggesting retention challenges for employers. So while it's a global report and contains some important common threads, um, it won't surprise you, as I've already said, that findings vary across countries and sectors. And I'll focus now on some of the headlines for larger professional services firms and also what UK based participants told us. So lack of job opportunities and job security is cited as the greatest concern by those respondents in smaller accountancy firms, the public sector and the charity and not-for-profit sector, but it's personal well-being and mental health for those in larger accountancy firms and those in the corporate sector. And this is a particular issue in larger accounting firms as respondents are much more likely to cite work-life balance as a career barrier. And across sectors, Gen Z employees in large accounting firms are least satisfied with their current work-life balance compared with their peer, peers working across all other sectors. 
Differences also prevail in what attracts individuals into the profession by sector, with those, for example, in the public sector, citing opportunities to acquire a professional qualification as the number one priority. But for those in larger accounting firms, that's not even in the top five. Um, and that's food for thought for those with structures built around traditional training contracts for professional, professional accounts, easy qualifications, and indeed for professional bodies like ACCA. As I mentioned, country results also give some fascinating insight into the different motivations of Gen Z as by location. We analysed what attracted Gen Z recruits to employers and careers across 16 separate countries. And it was only in the UK that job security was the highest rank factor. In Ireland and Singapore, for example, it was great work-life balance. And one final highlight, a strong employer brand really matters to Gen Z in larger firms, and it is the top satisfaction factor for those in the sector. So there's much more in the detailed report, as you can imagine, um, available on acaglobal.com, and I'm sure we can share it with Richard to share more directly with you. Uh, but I'll leave you with those nuggets to ponder on, and I look forward to our uh, conversation. Fantastic. Thank you, Helen. And that's, as I said, if you haven't had a chance to look at the report, it's a really valuable contribution because it's always, I always think it's interesting how you, it kind of swings. And I'm sure Oliver and Asak will have more views on that, that when times are good, sustainability and related matters seem to go up the agenda. When times are tough, it seems to come more back to me and my career and um, my personal situation. So, Oliver, tell us how you keep those two in balance, because you must have seen it through the last 10 years or so, going from, I won't say boom to bust and back again, but something like that, I suspect, in many contexts. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Richard. And, and hello, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, yes, I mean, so I've been working sustainability for 20 years, and I have to say that for a very long period of that time, it could be quite a frustrating role because on the one hand, you were working, you know, and, and I've been working with corporates all my career, but you're working towards helping corporates become more sustainable. And by, by sustainable, I mean, um, you know, managing the risks and opportunities from the environmental, the social and the governance agendas. Um, so it covers a whole range of topics and what those topics are will depend quite clearly by sector. And I'll get to the professional services bit specifically in, in a minute. Um, but so for many years, it was quite frustrating uh, because, you know, you saw companies wanting, trying to do the bad thing, but the, but the right thing, but the market not really responding, regulation not responding, investors not responding. And so therefore, it kind of didn't quite progress as fast as probably was needed. That has now changed quite significantly over the last three years, um, particularly with investors coming on board and really seeing that there is a material value to good sustainability performance. Uh, it's really changed uh, uh, the, way th the way things are. And I think that's quite that's really quite fascinating. Um, uh, now, part of the driver for that was the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 as well. They have all kind of created a framework through which uh, regulators, investors, customers, individuals, companies are much better able to address sustainability issues. Um, now, you said, you know, when times are tough, it tends to fall by the wayside. And that certainly was the concern at the start of the pandemic. Um, when, you know, you got a sense that actually because of the pandemic, um, considerations or concerns around climate change, uh, the need to act on certain some of these issues would, would fall to in the background. And actually quite the opposite is true. Uh, we've seen 2020 being a real time of stronger commitments towards sustainability, both from regulators. We've seen countries commit to net zero targets. We've had a very ambitious series of uh, plans from the European Commission. We see the Biden administration now pushing both the climate and the social justice agendas forward. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, investors have not lost any interest in this. The, the market for green bonds is absolutely exploding. Um, uh, ESG companies generally, companies that do well on ESG, have actually outperformed the market over the last year for two main reasons. One is that they are better, at, they're less leveraged, so less debt means you know in periods of crisis you fare slightly better, and second, better relationship with stakeholders, and by that I mean employees, uh, customers, suppliers, and also investors. And um, so it's actually been a really a, a really good year, but it, what it shows is a clear trend. Now, what's the role of professional services firms within all of that? Because you know quite clearly our impact as a professional services organization is, is reasonably small. 
you know, for most of us, it might have to do with with travel uh, footprints, office footprints, and that usually is pretty much it in terms of major environmental footprints. So, so whilst it's important to manage that, and certainly at Freshfields, we have managed that as well. Um, you know, we've got ambitious environmental targets, we've got ambitious diversity targets, both of which were communicated this year. Um, on the whole, um, you know, it, it's 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 not the way in which, as professional services firms, we can really have an impact and and serve both society and our clients in the best possible way. The other ways to have an impact um, relate, first of all, in terms of collaborations. So working both in partnerships with our clients or with other professional services firms or with regulators to come up with the kind of solutions that the market and society needs today. These are market solutions, solutions that actually drive growth, uh, drive profit, um, and, and, and come to come up with these solutions given the scale uh, of the challenges that we are facing really requires uh, um, you know, partnership. And we've we've done a lot of partnerships like that. So we've also signed up to some existing partnerships. We signed up to RE100, uh, which is the uh, uh, Renewable Energy 100 commitment. So so you commit to using only renewable energy through, throughout all your operations by 2030. Um, we've signed up to science-based targets to ensure that our climate targets are in line with uh, the, the, the climate science. Um, and we've also created some of our own partnerships, and I'll highlight two very briefly. One is something that we're doing with the United Nations, looking at the framework for impact. In other words, assessing in a number of different jurisdictions the extent to which a, an asset manager is able to take a decision with regards to the allocation of an asset for sustainability reasons that they may not have done for financial reasons. To give you an example, can a mainstream fund manager decide to exclude a company that generates the majority of its revenue from the production of coal. It might be that the financial case is strong, but can they do that even if the financial case for excluding that company is not strong? And we're, we're looking at that and we're expecting to have results in, in all these jurisdictions by the end of July. The second point is the one around, uh, the second partnership, sorry, is the uh, New York Circular Economy Initiative, which, which Richard alluded to earlier. And that's an initiative where we brought together some key players from the city of New York. So the mayor's office, uh, the Economic Development Corporation, who, who drives a lot of economic activity in New York, as well as companies like HSBC, um, ING, Goldman Sachs, um, Unilever, Cisco Systems, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as a key think tank in this space to help come up with a strategy for New York City to become a, a more circular city. In other words, to take waste out of its, uh, out of its uh, sub, sub, uh, environment effectively uh, through a number of different solutions, you know, reducing, uh, increasing the, 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 the length at which products stay alive, increasing uh, the reuse of products, the refurbishment of products, reducing waste collections, increasing recycling, all of those different avenues. Um, if you're interested in that, uh, we have websites, uh, circularnyc.org, where you can find out all about the research that we did and who participated in it. Now, I want to now focus very, you know, towards the end on the third pillar. So I talked about our own footprint um, as a professional service firm, which is relatively small. The second point is the importance of collaborations. And the third point and the key point for me is uh, working with clients. Our clients need us as professional services firm to help them in their transitions to a sustainable future. There is no doubt about it. And, and we see ourselves as lawyers. We see our role as being, you know, the, the, the kind of law firm that can enable the change that our clients want to make. Um, you know, we don't want to be barriers to change. We want to be enablers of change. And we believe that there is significant demand for the kind of services that, you know, lawyers, but other, you know, accountants, uh, uh, architects, um, financial organizations, et cetera, all kinds of professional services organizations are able to provide to help clients make that transition. And the great part of the story, of course, is that that drives revenue for us as well. You know, we are seeing a significant growth in the mandates that we're getting from companies, clients who want to improve on their own sustainability. Um, and, and that's driving uh, revenue for us as well. So you know, it's a complete win-win situation for the society, for our clients and for ourselves. And I'll leave it at that. Oh, thanks very much. So that was really helpful. And it was interesting how both 
you were talking about New York and Michael was talking about Paris. So, and Helen was also talking. So I think the location and cities are, are going to be very key issues as well. Uh, Francesca, welcome to the 50th. What are your thoughts for today? Oh, thank you very much, Richard. Good Lord, half a ton. How did that happen? Um, I think probably today is one of those situations where you kind of see the whole gamut of what the last 50 episodes has covered from uh, what's attracting people into the profession, what's exciting the profession and where the profession might be going. So quite a few things stood out for me today. Um, I, I'm really interested in the way Michael was talking about um, how he's really using MOOCs for their learning. And I'd love to get a chance to hear some more about that if we if we have an opportunity, uh, because I think there's something intriguing about how we're learning differently and the accessibility point. Um, we are incredibly accessible. And how, how do we use that accessibility at the moment? Are we using it in a constructive way? Are we using it in a way that's going to mean that we're doing more than just jumping onto a laptop where how can we keep evolving that? I think a lot of interesting discussion around that. And oh, do I love the ACCA survey. Um, just a massive, a terrific survey. I thought it was really interesting uh, read. I've had a quick skim at the executive survey, but I'm gonna go back and look at it in detail. Anyone who's recruiting, anybody should have a look at some of this. I live with three generation Zs. And I, I, a lot of, you got two. Um, and I was just crumbs. I was thinking, yes, a lot of the things that you mentioned resonated. But there's also that very interesting pandemic related item is I, I think a lot of them are really scared about getting a job but I love the fact that they're actually not just jumping into any old job but they're also really being much more flexible and open and the old days if you go into accounting you stay there for a zillion years and you retire I mean I think that had long since gone anyway but so many of my uh, children's friends are doing multiple very different jobs but they have quite a clear end game but the demands of the employer is quite fascinating. They don't want to join an organization they're not proud of. They don't want to join an organization that doesn't do all the things uh, that actually Oliver was talking about. You know, if the firm isn't sustainable, it doesn't have a strong ethical stance, if it doesn't have an interesting approach on gender diversity that's more than just a program, um, that's not an organization they want to be part of. They might be part of it for a very short period of time. That isn't where they want to stay. So I think there's a very interesting attractor which morphs into the sustainability point, a very interesting attractor about being um, not just sustainable in what you say, sustainable in what you do. Um, but one, just one additional point on the sustainability piece, which, which is utterly fascinating to see how people suddenly learn what ESG is, and it's just really exploded, hasn't it, in the last, in the last year, um, is the amount of clients who are desperate to have advice. And they kind of want to know, what do I need to do? What do I have to do? What would be good to do? And what would I do that take me beyond the curve? So I think from a profession, there's a huge amount we can do to help from the basics of valuations and the, the usual auditing kind of uh, elements of it through to the more cutting edge. So a huge growth opportunity, as well as something that just seems pretty essential for the planet. Fantastic. Uh, Michael, just picking up one of those points from Francesca there about MOOCs, do you want to uh, explain a bit more about how they work? Because not everybody is that familiar with the term, I think. Yeah, sure. Uh, massively online. Um, oh, gosh, darn it. <laughs> forgotten the, the acronym. M-O-O-C-S. Um, and uh, what we use is uh, basically free training courses. Uh, so, for example, EDX I would pick out or Coursera as, as two of the leaders in this space. Um, they don't necessarily have to be free, but even the free ones are extremely good. Um, and we use them in a, in a funny way, which is that, for example, in our firm, everybody has to understand computing. Uh, information technology is, is core to everything. Uh, and there's a lovely uh, six-week course. Uh, takes uh, not, not that long, a CS51 from memory. It's actually the old Harvard Applied Mathematics course I took years ago. Uh, and it's been it's been tarted up and everybody in our firm who doesn't have a computing qualification has to take that before they advance. Um, they're allowed to use uh, time. Uh, sorry, uh, <laughs> they're allowed to use uh, our time or do it on our time, uh, but they're tracked and progressed through the thing. And we then give them a certificate at the end, uh, which which we pay for. And I just think it's absolutely superb. And they come out of it not programming, although they do program in the course. It's not the reason for doing it. The reason is we want them to understand how information technology people think. That's the most important thing. I want to understand how you think. And the reason that's important is, in my opinion, easily half of the innovation 
over the last half century has been sticking a computer onto something, whether it's into your automobile or on some medical equipment. So you really have to understand where, where that comes from. Uh, and that's uh, on one discipline. For those who are accountants, and I won't go into this one, not accountants, they too have to take a finance course. Um, and again, uh, we, we do that. Through the, so the idea is that our younger staff are getting a grounding in most of the basic disciplines without necessarily, and uh, I happen to be uh, an FCCA as well, without necessarily going for the full qualification, but they've got that grounding that they understand how other people think. And perhaps they wish to take that further and we support that as well. Um, Helen, just sort of staying with that, uh, obviously great to know that uh, Michael is, is one of your members. Uh, fantastic. We're members. very proud. <laughs> you learn everything. You learn something from every show, as they say. Um, but but what, how, do, how do long these uh, long distance, how do they fit in with your approach as the ACCA to helping your sure. uh, trainees uh, get mm -hmm. to a good place? Yeah, well, um, we've been converting to digital learning digital examinations over a period of years now and um, actually the the pandemic accelerated uh, our um, remote invigilation so actually being able to sit the examinations uh, you know from your home anywhere so it, it really it really is an end-to-end -end process now that can be gone through in a digital environment which I think is very, you know, I'm talking to a lot of employers all around the world. This is fantastic for their remotely based employees or those that they can't bring together in the same way. So it's been what we've remote vigilation that we've introduced as a contingency for the pandemic. But actually, that's going to be a tool that we use uh, going into the future. Interesting to hear Michael mention edX. He, he said edX. I refer to it as edX. I don't know which I don't know which it is. Uh, but we, we put um, our, our basic entry level modules. So as you may know, ACCA is excel accessible for people who are school leavers right through to PhD holders. They just come into the program at different levels and we put some of our basic um, modules onto the platform free of charge so people can go through that learning uh, process as part of our contribution actually to financial literacy but but also as drawing people into the profession in a, in a taste of fashion um, understanding you know the, those basis basic aspects of the profession that's been hugely successful I haven't got the statistic off the top of my head but you know tens of thousands of people have taken those modules uh, through, through edX so uh, that whole digital um, learning piece which is far 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 advanced now from the which it used to be maybe even 10 years ago where it was lob it on a lecture on and it's exactly as it would be if you're in a classroom hugely changed now very interactive bite-sized learning as Michael's saying for those who don't need to go the whole way different certificate certifications uh, diplomas uh, ways of getting the knowledge and experience that employees and employers need without necessarily training for professional but all adding up to that you know a pathway clearly to that if you need it or want it later in your career so again playing to the gen z piece of flexibility <laughs> building knowledge um and if you know if you read the detailed re report you'll see that the i think it was over 90 percent of the participants said they recognise they will be learning continuously throughout their careers, um, and we, you know, we have to find the ways of providing that learning that's flexible and uh, in innovative. Thanks, Helen. And, and all of us, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, you have a role at, at Cambridge University um, on a master's course there, which is another way of learning being shared. Um, what, what, how does, if you look at sustainability, picking up Francesca's point around clients needing help. Uh, with the process. I mean, to what extent can people be, I'll, I'll use the ghastly term, trained in sustainability. You'll object to it, I'm sure, but I'm sure you know where I'm coming from. How, how does that part work, do you think? I think, um, I mean, you're right. I think that the word training probably doesn't, doesn't really work well here. But the reality is, if I'm perfectly honest, none of this is rocket science. You know, you do not have to be a scientist to understand sustainability. Uh, you just have to read the papers, be aware, look at what's going on. There's some fantastic coverage in the FT. Uh, there's some great coverage in The Economist who really puts it into the context of our wider economic paradigm. We can learn a lot um, without having to, you know, to, to, to become the kind of experts that you think that, that speak a language that no one else understands. And we can apply a lot of that to our own organizations and to our understanding of our clients' needs. 
Um, so, so yes, there is a need. I think what, what we're seeing, the people coming through the Cambridge program are people who want to dedicate a lot of their professional activity to this agenda. Uh, and for them, I think the understanding of the wider frameworks and understanding of some of the issues that may not be talked about uh, in, in the public media um, is relevant. Um, but I think for, for most of us, you know, it really doesn't take uh, that much to understand the challenges that we're facing. It just requires a, you know, a, a willingness to look at the data, to look at what's out there. You know, we all have opinions on the pandemic these days. Well, we and we many of us have opinions on climate change. Where well, we should also have opinions on biodiversity. We should have opinions on on social justice. We should have opinions on inequality. And those opinions do not require a PhD. Um, so I think there's there's you know th there's a lot that we can learn from each other through open conversations as well as from you know well chosen publications. Thanks. It kind of reminds me in our little local village uh, a few years ago, somebody bought a field and said they were going to. Uh, run a silk farm on it um, and grow various trees etc and of course uh, it was an idea but I've never known a group of villagers become so expert in silk farming in my life so quickly. Uh, <laughs> Francesca any final thoughts from you I'm sad we're getting to that stage of the day. Well I think there's a there's a plenty to take away from today isn't there but I, I think perhaps the, um, the the piece that kind of resonates with me most of all from today's conversation is about how are we setting the stage for the future both in terms of what we're contributing how we're creating an environment that people want to be part of, but also well, how are we actually thinking beyond the short term? Because if we want to be continue to be successful in our professions, we need to be thinking about the people coming behind us and about the environment we want to give them, uh, that we'll leave them as a legacy. So it, it makes you think very much as we're looking at the 50th edition, uh, there's something there around legacy, isn't there? What is it that you're going to be proud of that you leave behind? Well, I think that's now, unfortunately, uh, the time to uh, sort of basically say that uh, I am. Uh, hope you found today valuable. I thought it was uh, a fun session. We really covered almost too much material in a funny way, I think. But do go and check out those reports. And as Oliver said, sustainability isn't rocket science. A lot of it you can get up to speed, help your clients through that process. And we as professional advisors are very good at researching something, analyze it and coming back to our clients. So I'd like to thank our panel. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Oliver for his thoughts on sustainability, uh, Helen for having organised, because I know that doing a survey of 9,000 people is no mean feat, uh, and then bring it all together in a few months and then come up with those really insightful uh, findings. So really, thank you very much for that. And I'd like to thank Michael for reminding us about basic, some of the basics of management. And as you say, we are much more accessible, but let's make sure we use that time sensibly um, rather than... <clears throat> moving into a world where everybody is being sort of big brothered and monitored every keystroke, which I have horror about. So I'd like to thank everybody on the, uh, the show today. I hope you all find it valuable. We're back next week. And uh, one of the people on next week is actually Ken Shuttleworth, who's an architect from Make. And he's fascinating because he won't take on a project unless the client is sustainable. That's an interesting step. Are we that bold in dealing with our clients or are we happy to take the money i'll leave you that kind of thought for next week and catch up with you then in the meantime bye for all and thank you to the panel <laughs>